Um, yeah, so that was a very nice introduction by Dirk. I don't have to uh, do too much uh, introducing the topic now. So, um, so I'm going to talk about some work, um, kind of looking at, uh, at, the, at the sort of the opposite end of the um, of the prediction pro problem, trying to figure out um, how far um, ahead we could um, potentially predict sea ice if we had uh, if we had if we had all of the um, components that we want in um, in prediction systems. And this is some work that was uh, essentially done. Um, as part of um, a, pro a project in the UK called Apposite, um, led by Ed Hawkins, um, and Stefan Teacher was was also working on this in Reading. Um, but we had a lot of a lot of help from um, fr from a number of groups. Um, too many to mention, um, but I've listed them here. Say again? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so. As you all know, so, um, Arctic sea ice cover has been decreasing um, very dramatically over the last um, over the last few decades. But it, after, but it sort of imposed on this um, very strong trend. There's actually a lot of year-to-year -year, uh, decade of variability, um, and there's been some uh, some arguments that this variability has been increasing in recent years with very dramatic. Um, uh, unprecedented minimums both in 2007 uh, and 2012. Um, and, you know, from an end user point of view um, and from a scientific point of view, trying to understand and be able to um, and know whether we can predict um, these year to year variations is, um, is quite an important scientific question. Um, this re uh, dramatic reduction in, uh, in summer sea ice cover has increased the amount of, has, well, has allowed the amount of shipping in the Arctic to increase. So it's increased sort of tenfold um, over the last decade or so. Um, and you can see here this, um, this is a plot by Nat Melia, um, who's a PhD student in Reading, who's been looking at um, shipping in the Arctic. Um, and you can see that there's actually quite a lot of activity. So this is density along here. And so you've got sort of on the order of sort of 10 ships or so um, going around here, um, particularly along the north coast of Siberia. Okay, so what's the current state of the art in terms of um, sea ice predictions? So this is a, um, a plot from a paper by Michael Sigmund, um, Environment Canada. So this is the CAN-SIPS um, sea ice prediction, um, seasonal prediction system. Um, on this graph here is the anomaly correlation. So the, the target month for the forecast is along the bottom here. Uh, and this is the lead time going backwards. Um, and what you can see is when, you, when the trend's included, there seems to be relatively high skill, which I guess is not, not surprising with you know, seasonal forecasts of the September minimum, potentially up around sort of point, point, uh, 7 or point 0.8 sort of when started from May. If you detrend this, however, um, you get much more um, modest skill. So, uh, and it looks in particular like the, the skill sort of drops off after about uh, after a few months or so. Um, but we also have these features such as um, uh, this sort of apparent sort of predictability barrier for ar around the early summertime. Um, but we'd like to know sort of whether or not these features that we see in the, um, in the skill metrics for these prediction systems are, um, are features of the real world um, or whether they're due to sort of observational or, or model inadequacies. Um, and in particular, trying to understand where the limit of predictability is so that we can kind of manage expectations about what we think we should be able to achieve in the future um, as we develop these systems is, is quite important. So that's what this um, project was essentially uh, designed to, um, to assess. Um, so, yeah, so we're trying to qu quantify the limit um, or the forecast horizon for or the predictability horizon of um, the Arctic um, environment, particularly sea ice on, on interannual um, timescales. Um, in particular, trying to like, determine the mechanisms um, and the variables that lead to, um, that lead to this predictability, um, in particular in, in model simulations and in reality. Um, and then sort of provide recommendations um, for forecast uh, centers in terms of the developments that they should put into their, their models. Okay, so I guess it's kind of help, helpful to think about these studies in terms of a sort of a hierarchy of predictability studies. So 
Um, so you can do sort of predict, the sort of simplest things you can do are these sort of uh, looking at predictor, predict and relationships. And um, a, a reasonable amount of this has been done for, for sea ice now. Uh, and I'll list a couple of papers here. Um, this um, Chevalier and Thomas Melia paper um, in 2012, um, in particular, sort of highlighted the the, uh, the role that sea ice thickness has as a potential predictor of um, of the summer sea ice uh, minimum. Um, but I'm really, but I'm going to mainly talk about these perfect model predictability experiments, which have essentially been um, been used to uh, assess the the limit of predictability um, in models. Um, first used by Griffiths and Bryan in 1997 to sort of demonstrate um, the sort of decadal predictability in the North Atlantic. Um, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, observing system experiments, which are essentially designed to figure out what, you know, where, the, where the sources of memory are in the climate system, um, which is kind of important to know. Um, and these sort of fall between uh, these kind of studies that you can do with observations, um, these sort of diagnostic studies, and sort of um, hind cast skill in a, um, an assessment of hind cast skill in, uh, in a seasonal or actual prediction systems. Okay, so, what, so the perfect model framework, I'm sure um, some of you are familiar with it, but just to run over it. Um, so it's essentially asking a question of how, um, how well um, climate models can predict themselves. Um, so in the real world, we don't have um, observations of a lot of the key variables, such as um, deep ocean, uh, um, sea ice thickness in, 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 our ca in the case of Arctic sea ice, um, and, other, and other things. We'd like to know sort of, but it, uh, and so one might expect that in, in, reality, in reality, the, the, the skill that you get is actually, a, is actually limited by these factors. But we don't have this problem um, if we try and if we, if we perform sort of predictability experiments um, in, in model space. However, obviously, predicting the real world um, with the same GCM is a much harder problem. Um, and, and so the, the, the skill that we get um, in these perfect model experiments is, um, is, is essentially uh, is, 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 is likely to be higher than the skill that we'd actually get if we were trying to use that GCM to predict the real world. Um, so in terms of ensemble design, so we had a lot of groups contributing to, um, to this experiment. So um, I've listed some of them here. Um, all, of the four, all of these experiments were started on at least the 1st of July, because we were particularly thinking about predicting the summer, summer sea ice cover. And um, we choose a range of initial states. So if I go back to the previous slide, so if this is the control, if we think about this line here as the control simulation, then you pick a... So you take a long sort of 200-year um, fixed forcing control run, um, and uh, all, all with sort of present-day um, uh, greenhouse gases and other forcings, and then we run this for 200 years and pick a number of start dates, and then initial, and then add some white noise um, to the initial state in the atmosphere, and then um, and then because the system's chaotic, the ensemble members diverge. And, um, and the rate at which this happens tells you something about how predictable um, the model is, or how predictable the climate is in the model. Um, and these were all, these were, um, the, what the groups did between sort of eight and 16 ensemble members to sort of really sort of um, um, get some robust statistics. Um, and then they were run for, um, for three years to, um, to, to look at a um, forecast horizon. Okay, so these are the these are some plots from um, from the model. So, uh, to, so we've got the seasonal cycle of sea ice extent and volume up here. Um, you can see that there's actually an enormous amount of variety. Um, so, uh, but they do kind of so the black line here is the is the had ISST observations, um, and then the pie mass reconstruction um, for sea ice volume, and yeah, and there's there's a very wide range. Similarly, for um, the sea ice variability, um, you can see here that, the, um, that there's quite some spread, both in terms of the um, shape of the seasonal cycle and the magnitude um, of the variability as well. Um, 
These are the predictability metrics that we get. So we use a couple. So um, normalized sea ice extent, um, uh, sorry, normalized root mean square error here. Um, so um, essentially when this, so it starts off very low, um, so with, because we've got perfect, you know, perfect skill at, at you know, in the, or close to perfect skill in the first month. And then um, when it reaches one, um, essentially uh, there's, no, there's no predictability left in the system. Um, and the sort of the black dots indicate when there's when when it's not significantly different from one, and you can see that despite the fact that there's very large differences in the mean state, the predictability in the models is actually um, fair. It's fairly similar. I mean, the detail there are some differences in the details, but it looks like at least some of these models um, they are sort of predictable throughout the full length of the the simulation. Others not so much. Um, in particular, this um, E6F model here, which is from, uh, which is a, a model that come, came from RV. Um, the, it's only predictable for the first summer, and then the second and third summers have no predictability at all. Um, but it continues to be predictable in the winter throughout the, the length of the simulation. Um, the anomaly correlations here so show something quite similar. Um, I, I, you know, predictability at, at long lead times for some of the models. Uh, and then sort of shorter lead time in others. Sea ice volume, on the other hand, is, tends to be um, a lot more predictable. Um, some of the models, um, but again, this, this E6F model suggests that volume's predictable for more like a year and a half, and some of the models, um, it looks like volume's predictable um, for, the, for all, all three years. Okay. Um, so we can plot, we can look at the, um, the spatial maps of this, and unsurprisingly, most of the errors occur in the, around in the marginal ice zone. Um, and these plots are essentially, what the differences between these plots are essentially looking at differences in wh where there's um, sea ice concentration variability um, in, in, in the model's climatology in September. Um, and this is the same for, for ice thickness. So we have quite large errors. Um, around the coastlines where, um, where any sort of errors in the wind field um, result in ice piling up along the coastline and sort of mag magnify um, errors there. Okay, so, so, we think, so it looks like there's a lot more predictability um, in these models than we see um, in state-of-the-art forecast systems, but we'd like to know why this is. So, um, there's some large gaps in the, both the atmosphere and the ocean observing systems, particularly in the polar regions. Um, Satellite-derived sea ice thickness products are, are, are becoming available, um, but they've, got, they've still got some, some sort of problems. So satellite altimeters like Cryosat um, have problems with thin ice, so, um, so they're only really... Um, so, so they've sort of the operational range is mainly over sort of um, uh, for ice over a meter thick. Um, radiometers such as SMOS can, can only um, can't distinguish ice which is thicker than than half a meter. Um, and then crucially, there's issues whenever there's a melting surface. So the, so the, so, the, so um, remote sensing of sea ice thickness or freeboard and, and sea ice thickness is quite difficult um, throughout the summer, which is probably when we'd most like to have. Um, have the information, but we, you know, for which component is the largest source of predictability? Um, so we've tried, we've done some experiments looking at um, the role of sea ice thickness to try and assess how important it is um, in, in terms of model initialization. So we essentially ran another set of simulations um, with the HadGem model, uh, essentially twinned with the, the experiments that we did with this model before. And then we rerun these perfect model simulations, um, started both in January and in July, except we replaced the initial state in the sort of perfect initial state in the model. Um, we, well, the sea ice thickness is replaced with the model climatology everywhere else. But, um, but everything else, such as the, um, the ocean um, and the atmosphere initial conditions, are all exactly the same um, as the perfect one. So we're just looking at the, the impact of um, degrading the skill, the, the memory in the sea ice thickness. Uh, and this is what we get. So this is um, the nor normalized root mean square error again. Um, so the solid lines are th uh, the pair of forecasts which are started in January. Um, the, black uh, the black line is the perfect 
forecast. So it's like it's um, has, and the red line is the um, is the one where the sea ice thickness was removed. Um, as you can see, there's actually quite a. They're actually very similar through the through the through the um, through the first six months of the forecast started in January, and then they're slightly different in um, during the summertime. But if you um, if you start these simulations during the melt season, then essentially the the predictability almost disappears. So looking at the difference between the black dashed line and the red dashed line here, um, there's, a, there's an enormous reduction in the skill. Just, just from removing the, um, any knowledge of the thickness. But it's, but it's very dependent on the, st the start date. Uh, so why is that? Uh, so we can look at some spatial maps to, to try and understand this a bit better. So this is the um, uh, root mean square error of the sea ice thickness field. So we've imposed these errors, so it's not a surprise that they're there. And they essentially, as the error in the um, in the unperturbed simulation increases, then the difference the uh, the difference in the errors between the two simulations decreases. But it doesn't have much impact on the uh, on the sea ice concentration field. Um, certainly to start off with, and then through till March, uh, and in September we sort of when the when the sea ice sort of um, contracts and the, and these sea ice thickness anomalies. Um, affect the pattern of melting, then we get these uh, this sort of imprint of the of the thickness errors um, can be can be seen. Um, okay, so when we start simulations in July, it looks quite similar in terms of the um, the change in the, the thickness errors, but um, but crucially, the sea ice concentration um, field the errors are actually much larger than they are in January, um, almost almost initially. Because essentially, the um, any errors in the thickness are actually changing um, wh where the um, the rate at which um, ice is melting um, as we progress through the melt season, and the September, you know, and, the, um, and essentially it removes all skill that we all of the the, the memory um, that results in sort of skillful prediction of concentration for the for, for the start. Um, but then, essentially, it only seems to be an issue for the first summer. Yeah. Okay. So th these are um, this is so in terms of the atmospheric impact, uh, it seems to have quite a large impact on the skill during the first month, um, particularly when we initialize in January. Um, but it does, but it, um, but the, but it, and it's much more. Um, so this is the increase in percentage increase in in error. Um, of, the, of the mean sea level pressure field. Okay, so in summary, um, looks like there's potential skill for potentially skillful predictions of sea ice extent for one to two years or so in summer, longer in winter, um, and much longer in uh, um, predictability for, for volume. Um, but model biases and a lack of complete observations really reduce this skill when predicting the real world. Um, and I think that sea ice thickness is we demonstrate that sea ice thickness is particularly important um, for improving uh, these forecasts. Um, and this data set is available, the predictability data sets I think are available at the BADC if anyone's interested in looking at them for other things. So I'll just leave some discussion points up there.